Canaan, a land ravaged by wars, waged by bigger empires that border it to the north and south. While Hatti and Egypt may pay little attention to the land that they see primarily as a land bridge inhabited by wild dogs, in these tumultuous times, leaders will rise to prove to these nations that they have been so wrong to underestimate them. From the humble diplomat to the great raider, Canaan will rise from the embers of both Hatti and Egypt in this great collapse, through either subterfuge or simply adding to the flames themselves. Before we begin, a quick note. Total War Pharaoh is still in development, and certain things may change between now and release. Also, some colors may appear a little different on the UI. This is because I'm using colorblind settings. So with that out of the way, let's look at Kanan. The leaders you'll take command of from Kanan in Total War Pharaoh couldn't be more different from one another. They do, however, share one common thread. They'll both stab you. Let's start off with Irsu, as he wouldn't have it any other way. Starting out in Retgenu, he has a very simple, yet very respectable approach to ruling. He doesn't care to. He simply sees what he wants, and he will kill to get it. Resources, money, or the simple premise of violence. If you have something he wants, he will not ask. He will simply take. In dark, apocalyptic times such as these, he doesn't care for society's downfall. He simply cares for the next opportunity to raise and loot. To himself, he's a prize fighter, bringing the heavyweight champions to their knees. To the rest of his lands, he's a herald of the oncoming apocalypse. Over in Fenku, we have the opposite in approach to Irsu with the diplomat, Bey. Enamoured by Egyptian high society, and already in decent standing with Menepta, he intends to find his way into the courts and spread his control and influence throughout it, offering gifts with one hand whilst taking with many more. Bey's approach to power is much stealthier than Irsu's, in that he would rather manipulate in the shadows than spill blood in the light. Where Irsu seeks chaos, Bey seeks to stem Anarchy's tide through charming politesse and political scheming. He'll rise to power either with a puppet pharaoh or even breaking beyond Egyptian norms and taking the crown himself. Throughout all this though, his visage remains the same. A humble diplomat from Canaan, a learned man who just wants to do good. Just don't delve deeper, lest you want a dagger in your back. Whether they're seeking the pharaohs or the great king's crown, the leaders of Canaan can choose their path, or simply elect to take their own. It's not only the motives that make Irsu and Bey drastically different from one another, but also how they play as leaders, and how you'll build their empires from the ground up. Bey isn't the kind of man to stand boisterously, and act strong and powerful, instead he's much more cerebral. His approach to power is different from most of the other factions in Total War Pharaoh. While like other leaders he does intend to build himself up in power, he doesn't take the usual bronze weaponed adorned roads. He's weak when faced head on, so would rather work in the shadows. Utilizing influence, diplomatic relations, and subterfuge, Bey utilizes the vast amount of resources he can gain from his buildings to make friends with diplomatic gifts, before he eventually stops giving and starts taking Let's massively. His closeness to Egypt puts him in a unique position as a Canaanite. He actually begins worshipping the Egyptian deity Thoth, as opposed to any of the Canaanite gods. He also gains more legitimacy to the throne whenever he's holding a position within the courts, as well as legitimacy when plotting. He can even take it from the Egyptian factions he targets, making him a formidable political opponent. His unique buildings are all about bolstering legitimacy, influence, and resource production. The lighter side of Bey's facade can be seen in the singing competition and the chief scribe's headquarters, which increase happiness, influence, legitimacy to the throne, and diplomatic relations across the lands. Meanwhile, Bey's more pragmatic side can be found in the regional fair, which increases production rates. Finally, there's the Smuggler's Bay, which brings in a vast amount of wooden food. This amount increases the further society collapses, with resource amounts increasing from prosperity, to crisis, and finally to collapse. In Egypt and Hatti's darkest days, he'll proffer himself as the beacon that'll ensure these lands survive, 
but he'll make sure they know precisely how they did. Irsu, meanwhile, sees power very differently. He already has it, and he's going to make everyone else feel it. Where Bay seeks to create networks and pull the strings, Irsu is much more interested in tearing the whole thing down, taking what he wants, and leaving base camps and capitals whilst leaving everywhere else as rubble. Things like economy, happiness, and diplomacy mean very little to him. He'd rather wage war and take what he wants, delivering a cruel lesson to those who'd stand against him. While he's not exactly ecstatic about the idea of settling down in places, a good raider knows you need at least some bases of operation. Sometimes you have to extort everything out of those you impose your rule over to keep your war camp moving. Iosu's unique buildings exemplify this. The forced labour camps hugely improve production rates and workforce growth, at the heavy cost of happiness. He's not exactly in the business of making smiles, though. So he's willing to utilise an iron fist to quell rebellions if he needs. Irsu's gold tally quarters bolster influence, happiness, production, and even legitimacy if he ever felt the need to seek the crown. Lastly, a building close to Irsu's heart is Irsu's war camp. Increasing recruitment slots and ranks in a region, this building also increases loot taken from conflict and raiding. While Bay offers himself as the hand that'll save these lands, Irsu is the boot, crushing those lands down and taking what he wants. What's yours is his. Though Canaan might not be as big as Egypt, it is still home to mighty warriors. We previously covered on how recruiting units and total war pharaoh worked in our Egyptian deep dive, stating that there are forces that are unique to your leader, and some that are unique to the land. Canaanite forces are stuck between two different types of militaristic beast, and therefore need to be able to adapt to both the speed of the Egyptians and the heavy armour of the Hittites. Canaan's forces utilise medium armour, sacrificing a modicum of the speed the Egyptians utilise, whilst also keeping a balance of speed and protection against Hattie's heavily armoured juggernauts. Canaanite units also commonly come with the Raider attribute, meaning whilst they're fighting in the streets, they may start setting fire to buildings at your command. In Bay's starting location in Fenku, we find the native Fenku and Yamad forces. These forces span the entirety of the armour spectrum, preparing them for war from both the north and the south. They have lightly armoured units capable of decent ambush tactics, whilst medium and heavy armoured units bring decent defence, capable at holding out against chariot charges from Egyptian forces. Meanwhile, Irsu starts near local forces viewers of the Egyptian deep dive may recognise, as these are the Sinai and Ratjenu militia also utilised by Ramesses. While the forces may be familiar, under Irsu's command you'll be utilising them for different reasons. Where Ramesses sees these forces as yet another decent force in his local militias, for Irsu, their speed and range can be absolutely pivotal. The Sinai and Retgenu local forces pick up the slack where Irsu's unique forces may falter, with decent ranged units, discipline, and fantastic speed. But this doesn't mean Irsu's a slouch, as we'll cover in the next section. Finally, Canaanites are the only factions capable of gaining access to either the Pharaoh's Guard we mentioned in the Egyptian deep dive, and the Great King's forces, which we'll leave for our deep dive into the Hittites. We don't want to take our eyes off of Irsu, or Bey for that matter. Taking your eyes off of Bey, in fact, could well be the last mistake you'll ever make. His forces are as treacherous on the battlefield as he is in the courts. Specialising in ambush tactics, nearly all of Bay's unique forces have the ambusher trait, meaning they're difficult to spot in even the most open of terrain. They're also capable at disabling a majority of an army's defensive and offensive capabilities. They strike fast with surgical precision in underhanded ways, much like their leader in the courts. If, however, you find stealth both in the courts and on the field to be too slow an approach, then the unique forces of Irsu are for you. His forces, much like himself, are adorned in the heaviest armour, letting them shake off pathetic stones from slings and absolutely crush any lighter armoured opposition in melee combat. 
He even utilizes heavy chariots that can decimate missile forces with ease. He may harbor some lighter armored units, even one with bows, but their purpose is simple. Be expendable and harass the enemy until the big guns come in. His forces can be reckless in combat, which can be utilized by certain units' stances, and some of his forces even have the heedless charger trait. But with their heavy armor, in many cases they can afford to be this bloodthirsty. To them, this isn't a structured war with honor. This is a bloody battle, and they're here for a fight. So these are the Canaanite leaders you'll be taking command of in Total War Pharaoh. From the brutish might of Iasu to the cunning stratagems of Bey, will you be the hand that pulls the strings of these civilizations from the Age of Collapse to the Age of Canaan? Or will you be the herald of the apocalypse, reveling in the destruction wrought by your hand and the dark cloud on the horizon? Whether it's a dynasty to be proud of or an empire of ash, Will you bring Canaan to glory?